Uh, what we're going to start with is chapter one. So, you know, Wednesday was pretty complicated, um, but now we're going to slow down and we're going to talk about uh, development of x rays and just uh, the general principles that had, had to be in place in order for x rays to be discovered, x rays to be uh, developed as a um, imaging modality and a, a a, a way to, to make a diagnosis that is very dangerous to start with, and it's uh, become far less so. It still is something that needs to be respected well. Uh, the, the type of radiation that we utilize. Okay, that's working. Good. And that's why I don't have a remote, because this thing is actually working. Okay, so let me get rid of it for now. We don't need it for a bit. All right, so uh, what we need to, to study first is just nature of surroundings. And he gets pretty basic with it in explanation that everything is either matter or energy or, you know, a combination thereof. Maybe matter that utilizes energy, and that's what you are. You're made of stuff. But at the same time, you've got biochemistry that allows you to move. Okay, so in that movement, you've got energy. You got uh, conversion of matter to energy, which is a very common thing that we just don't, uh, we kind of take for granted, but it happens around us all the time. Things grow, um, trees grow, uh, absorbs nutrients, and, and creates matter out of the energy that, that is converted from those nutrients. So matter, energy, or a combination thereof. So um, in matter, Anytime we have matter, we've got stuff, we've got substance, right? So with a substance, what we've got is uh, something made of something. So if you were to take and you were to divide something out to the smallest possible fraction without it turning into something totally different, um, what you've got is atom, right? So atoms join together to create, you know, a group of atoms, and you mix atoms together to create a, uh, uh, some sort of molecule like water. What is water? H2O. H2O. It's two parts hot hydrogen, one part oxygen. You join together to create something totally different. You join enough of those together and you got a pond. You increase the pond, you got a lake, right? So um, matter is uh, made of, of atoms arranged in certain ways so that they join together to create. Um, you know, molecules, molecules create a compound, a compound creates a substance, and eventually you got something that you can see, feel, touch, whatever. So, uh, the uh, characteristic matter is that it's made of atoms, it's made of stuff, it occupies space, it has mass. We have a tendency to think of mass as weight, and it's really not the same thing. Um, there is generally weight to mass, um, but it's not necessarily the same thing. Like Bouchon, uh, you know, his first example, his first uh, analogy really is of uh, the human body and its specific weight in different environments. Um, the moon, the gravitational pull of the moon, is about one sixth of what it is here on Earth. So if you were to travel to the moon, First off, you're in a weightless environment before you get to the moon. Um, did you lose all your weight? Mm -hmm. Traveling a rocket ship? No, you didn't. Your weight's still there, your mass is still there. The only thing that's changed is that you haven't got the, nearly the effects of gravity as what you had here on Earth. But once you get to the moon, you've got gravity again, but it's not as significant as what it was here. So uh, you weigh about one sixth on the moon of what you weigh here. And it's really pretty interesting, um, the, the significance of that, that drop in weight. Um, when my son, my oldest son, was, um, he was when he was a little kid, his, his two career paths, that he, he's, he's a fabricator welder, uh, by the way. But when he was a little kid, you know, everybody wants to be a fireman or whatever. He wanted to be either a spider scientist He's deathly afraid of spiders now, or an astronaut. And so when he was a little guy, I took him to uh, Huntsville, Alabama, and they have a uh, space camp. And so, you know, most of y'all, you know, pretty young. Uh, if you have kids and, and any of them shows 
any kind of interest in space, uh, I, rec I highly recommend space camp. Because uh, when they're little, then they have a parent-child space camp and you get to go too, and you get to play on the simulators and all that kind of stuff. And one of the simulators is what they call the one-sixth chair. They developed this thing to simulate uh, gravity on the moon so that they could train the people, you know, the astronauts on how to walk on the moon. And you see the astronauts kind of hopping. The reason for that is because your weight on the moon is one sixth of what it is here. You don't lose any mass. You're still you once you get to the moon. The problem is that here on the earth we walk easily because we've got all this gravity pulling us down to the earth. But once you get to the moon, it's only one sixth of that. So if you weighed 120 pounds on the moon, you would weigh one sixth of that, which would be how much? 125 by six would be 20 pounds, right? So you don't have nearly the traction on the moon as what you have here on the earth. And that sounds really complicated, the one sixth chair. It sounds like some you know, big, you know, complicated thing that's not. What it is is basically an L-shaped seat that they strap you into. So, uh, you know, here you are, there's your head, there's your body, and your legs are hanging off down here. And they put a harness on you, and they suspend it from what amounts to garage door springs. NASA. All right. So what they do is they put you on this, and they put you on some uneven ground, and they tell you, okay, walk across that. And you cannot do it. You just, you know, it's like, You've seen the cartoons where people, you know, the cartoon character tries to run. It works out about like that. So what you have to do is do that hopping motion in order to walk with one sixth of gravity. So what changed? Gravitational. Gravitational pull, right. So weight is not the same as mass. Weight is the gravitational effects on a mass, okay? We really use them interchangeably, so it's kind of like splitting hairs, but uh, you know, it's, it's significant enough that, that we need to understand that weight and mass are not necessarily the same thing. Another example is um, if you had sitting in front of you uh, a bar of lead and a bar of aluminum, could, and, and you were just looking at them, could you tell the difference between the two, do you think? Probably not. Probably not. If you walked over and tried to pick them up, have you ever picked up aluminum? Yes. All the time, you do. You, you pick it up and you take a drink out of it, right? Uh, aluminum can. Have you ever done that with a lead can? Yeah. <laughs> You've drank out of a lead cup? Oh, I've never drank, but like, there are these leads that go on roofs. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, they're cylindrical ones. Right, I, I know what you're talking about. I was, I was hoping somebody didn't, you know, have you drinking out of a lead cup. Uh, <laughs> That's not a friend. No. Uh, so uh, lead is significantly heavy, heavier. So a bar of aluminum that would be maybe eight inches long, about four inches, you could pick up probably with, with one hand fairly easily. It'd be heavy, but it probably wouldn't be much heavier than one of those books over there, as opposed to if you tried to pick up a bar of, of lead, it would be significantly heavier. Okay. So volume-wise, identical. But what changes there is the elemental mass. So, you know, the, 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 the external appearance of that object weighs totally different because of the gravitational effect on the object itself. Okay, so weight and mass not necessarily the same thing. We'll use them interchangeably, so, you know, don't get too hung up on that, but um, for the sake of, of understanding where we're going with, with elemental structure later in the semester, it's, it's worth pointing it out, okay? Now this data. All right, so um, made of, of atoms, uh, molecules joined together, eventually you got mass measured in kilograms. So it can be transferred from one type to another. Also, he uses an analogy of, of water and the different states that you can have water exist. And water is really a fascinating stroke. Uh, substance. Um, if you were to blow up a balloon, you know, you got a balloon full of air and you stick it in the refrigerator, what do you think is going to happen to it? It gets smaller. It gets smaller, right. Uh, is it because the balloon loses air? No. The answer is no. Most things, when they get cold, they shrink. 
right? In the wintertime, you go outside, you get your rings on. Um, what, what happens sometimes? You go down to the Guadalupe River and you're swimming. Do you want to wear your rings? No. No, why? Yeah, you get cold and you shrink, even though you may have water, which doesn't really, you know, seem to, to fit here. But if you put a, a, uh, one of your canned Cokes in soft drinks inside of the freezer, what's it in danger of doing? Exploding. Exploding, right. Even if it doesn't explode, what happens to the can? It explodes. Yeah, it bubbles out, right? So uh, water, when it gets cold, it expands. So you take ice and you put it in a cup of water, and what happens to the ice? It melts, but before it melts, what does it do? Expands. What's that? Expands. Well, it, it does expand when it melts, but what, what immediately when you drop it in the water, what happens? It cracks. It floats, right? So it floats. It's lighter, yet bigger, right? It expands when it freezes, and yet it becomes lighter than the substance it's made of. Okay? So it melts, and then you put it on a stove top, and you turn a burner on, and what happens? It gets hot and then it boils and it what comes out of the pan? Steam. Steam, right. So it vaporizes. So it vaporizes and it becomes a cloud, right? Eventually. It'll become a cloud. So it expands also when it gets hot. It gets cold, it expands, and it gets light. It gets hot, it expands, it gets light. But if you could collect all of those molecules and bring them back together, you have the same mass. Okay? Three different states, <clears throat> totally different appearance, um, same mass, um, but three different levels of existence in all those. Okay? So matter and energy. Energy can also be transformed from one type to another. I'll take this down because that looks awful. I'm looking at it. Um, so you got a lot of different types of energy. You can transfer um, matter to energy, energy to matter, we'll talk about that in a minute, but uh, you can also transfer energy to energy type. And we'll talk a little bit about this on, on Wednesday. Um, so uh, all the different types of energy that we're interested in, we've got potential energy. I touched on that on Wednesday. What was potential energy? Stored, stored, stored energy. energy is unrealized, right? Energy of position. So, you know, he's got the <laughs> gruesome analogy of a guillotine with a blade hung up, um, and it took work to get that blade up there, but once it's up there, it's, you know, it's stored energy, it's energy of position. A lot of, of uh, uh, textbooks will refer to it as energy of position. It's not currently doing any kind of work, but because of where it is, um, and because of, in the case of the guillotine, because of the uh, gravitational pull on the blade, you've got the chance to create work if you release that potential and it becomes realized energy. All right. And when I need it, it's not gonna work. Okay. So, uh, kinetic energy is what we refer to as the type of energy or the energy that was stored that becomes energy of motion. So kinetic energy is energy of motion. Stored energy is, kinetic, or is, uh, is potential. And once that potential is released, we've got kinetic energy. Energy of motion. When we test, or are we going to test over a certain, like a group of chapters at a time? Generally, one chapter at a time. One. Okay.
demonstration of what is kinetic and what is potential energy. Alright, so let me uh, pause this for a second. So kinetic energy or potential energy can take a lot of forms. So I mentioned potential energy is energy of, of position, uh, gravitational pull, but that that's only one example. So anything that's in a bind essentially in, in some way that if you release it, it becomes kinetic energy is potential energy. So it's basically a mousetrap. In a mousetrap, what do you have? A spring. So basically a spring, right? So you got a spring, this is what we call a bait stick. Um, so on a bait stick, what, what, you do, what you do when you, you set a, a, a mousetrap is you, you put, you increase the tension on the spring. So you got to increase tension, that's increased potential. You lock that thing back, but on the bait stick, the bait stick is basically the trigger. So that once the bait stick is depressed, then what it does is it releases the energy, some of the energy on the spring so that this spring goes back to basically what would be its resting position, which really still has some potential energy to it. If you were to cut that loose, it, it will continue to go. Um, but uh, anyway, you, you increase the potential by... Uh, by increasing the tension on the spring. So he sets this thing. Uh, if you're not familiar with the Roadrunner and the, the uh, Coyote, this is an old cartoon. Coyote's always trying to eat the Roadrunner and he's totally incompetent and he you know, gets himself in trouble, never catches. I think the one episode he caught the, the Roadrunner, but uh, it was under circumstances he didn't want to catch the Roadrunner. So he sets the trap, trap snaps, he goes back out, and he got something he didn't expect. So the rat resets the trap, sticks his tail in it, and he gets it again. Or get, gets it. The coyote. So he's compressed the spring. He's, he's pushed the spring back just as far as it'll go. He leans back up against it. I'm just going to put this on the side. He leans back up against it. So he's got what kind of energy? Potential. Potential energy, right. So his feet are providing some friction so the spring doesn't extend. Um, but once the Roadrunner comes by, he lifts his feet. The potential is realized in kinetic energy. Uh, it's just not exactly what he had planned. So he's got kinetic energy, now we've got potential energy again. So he starts to fall, and we've got what kind of energy? Potential. Kinetic, exactly. So he's kinetic energy again. Now he pulls the string, the, the spring tight. So what do we have? Potential. potential. Rock starts to move, and we've got Kinetic energy again, exactly. So you see the difference between potential energy and kinetic energy. Uh, kinetic energy occurs once the potential is released. Okay, so we're going to get rid of those for now. We'll take a look again at a different video here in a bit. Not on energy, but on something totally, uh, totally different. So we've got potential, we've got kinetic. We've also got chemical energy. And the, the book gives you a couple of different examples like you eat, uh, you digest the food, and uh, the biochemistry inside of your body uses that food for energy. He also uh, uses an example of uh, dynamite. You know, you get uh, sulfur, saltpeter, and something else in dynamite, and you, you put a catalyst to it, a flame, and it blows up. But really, I think he's kind of missing the mark in as much as there's something else that you're much more familiar with that um, you use every day. Car. Car would be one. Where do you use chemical energy in car? Combustion. Combustion, that's an example. I would say there's even one more, more familiar to you. As far as chemical? Mm -hmm. Heating. Heating. Eating. 
Well, that, that's the biochemistry we were talking about. What did you say? I said the same thing. Oh, you said so, I thought somebody said battery. I did. Okay, battery. Exactly. A battery is nothing but a chemical reaction to give you a different type of energy, which is electrical energy. Okay, so in a battery, what you've got is different chemistry that, that interacts, and uh, if you've got a, a complete circuit of some sort, then it sends electrons through that circuit and you get electrical energy. Electrical energy is just movement of, of electrons, and we use electrical energy uh, sometimes all by itself, and sometimes in order to accomplish something else. So by itself, we'll use uh, electric energy for heating, all right? So uh, you put a piece of toast in the toaster, you pr press the thing, you know, the little plunger down, and you look inside of the toaster, and what do you see? Heat. Yeah, it's, it, the coal is red hot, and that is only because what you've got is electricity flowing through those coils of wire, and there's too much, fundamentally, there's too much electricity going to those coals, so they get hot, okay? Same thing occurs in a light bulb. All a light bulb is is conversion of, um, of electric energy to both heat and light. It gets so hot, it glows. That's an incandescent light. That's not really your fluorescent lights or your LED lights, but in an incandescent light that gets really hot, that's what you got going on there. Um, also, motors, you know, he mentions motors, heaters, uh, blowers, your hair dryer is all conversion of, of electric energy to uh, different types of energy. All right? So, it's electric energy. We've got thermal energy, which is just heat. Um, and they refer to thermal energy as being uh, kinetic energy on, on the molecular level. You know, you rub your hands together, and what you're doing is you're rubbing all of, of your molecules together and it creates heat, okay? So it's molecular kinetic energy. It's movement, a lot of movement of, of uh, uh, molecules to release thermal energy. Nuclear energy, you got a couple of different things there. You got nuclear energy in, in power plants and of course nuclear energy in, in nuclear weapons. But uh, you know, the, the, the book says, and Bouchon I think is, opening statement for electromagnetic energy, which is really where, where we're going to spend a lot of time this semester is in uh, different types of electromagnetic energy. He says, probably the least familiar form, and that's not true, it's probably the most familiar form of energy, uh, but it's probably the least understood. Okay, it's a big difference between those two. So if you flip over to figure 3-6, which is on page 49, what you'll see is a graphic, a table, essentially, that shows you the different levels or different types of electromagnetic energy. So you look on the right-hand side, and starting at the bottom, what do you see? MR. What's that? MR. MR? Uh, page 49? Yeah, oh, uh, uh, yeah, page 49. Uh, table 3-6, what do you say at the bottom of that? Radio frequency, mm -hmm. right? So you turn on, your, turn on your radio, and what you've got there is a signal that's coming from a tower that's uh, reaching your, your antenna on your car, and the way that travels is through electromagnetic energy. It is a type of electromagnetic energy. You come up from that, and what do you see? Microwaves. microwaves. You ever use a microwave? <laughs> Probably most of your cooking is done in microwave oven, right? Okay, what's directly above that? Infrared. infrared. What do you associate with infrared? <clears throat> Light. Not good. Light. And your hamburger sits right up under this lamp at McDonald's all the time to keep it hot. hot. Right, so heat. So you got heat, uh, infrared, and then above infrared, what do you have? Visible light. Unfamiliar with visible light, are you? I would hope not. Do you really understand visible light, though? Probably not. You use it to see, but you don't know what it is, right? 
Uh, and then right above that, you got what gives you a sunburn, and then right above that, you got x-rays and gamma rays. Okay, so electromagnetic radiation has some properties that are similar, um, that being that they all travel at the same speed. So what's right in the middle of this, in the, in the middle of the spectrum? Visible light. Visible light, right. So we say visible light travels at the speed of? Light. Light, right. <laughs> all right, so all types of electromagnetic radiation travel at the same speed, and that is the speed of? Light. Light, light. exactly. So uh, regardless of how powerful the x-ray beam is or how powerful the light is, you know, you just stack them up side by side and they travel at the same speed, that being the speed of light. So that's property number one. And the other is that they travel in sinusoidal fashion. They travel in waves. There's some differences between different uh, uh, energy levels and what they can accomplish, but uh, they're all electromagnetic radiation. Okay, so we'll, we'll talk about those. That's, again, that's a little bit deep for this particular test. You're not gonna have to know all those different levels of electromagnetic radiation for this test but um, we'll get there. So why do we need to know all this stuff? Well, glad you asked. Where do we get our electricity? A power plant. A power plant, right? So I know I, I started the recording on Wednesday after you know I said it's much easier to draw a nuclear power plant than what it is, you know, coal, coal burning power plant. So uh, first thing is, We've got nuclear energy providing what kind of energy? Electric. Electrons, yeah, electric energy. So electric energy uh, is supplied from the power plant. So we've got uh, nuclear energy creating electric energy. So it gets to, and it, it travels a very high voltage. It may be, you know, millions of volts even. It's going to be extremely high voltage. Can you use extremely high voltage in your house? No. no. Unless you want to burn your house down. So what do we have that will change that from extremely high voltage to voltage you can use? Substations. Okay, you got substations, but after the substation, before it gets to your house, what do you have? Transformers. Transformers, exactly. Transformers out on a telephone pole. That's a thing that the squirrels get into. So you got a transformer and it's going to adjust the voltage down to something you can use. Okay, so in the hospital, the same thing happens. All right, so we got the hospital, it's a hospital. Now once it gets into the imaging system, this is really kind of where y'all came in on Wednesday, um, what do we have to do to it? Um, you want to watch the video? Yes, yeah, so like change the level with the Bingo. We're going to change the, the, uh, the energy level of it so that we're going to take, you know, and we made it easy. We said 100 volts is what we're supplied. And it goes into a thing that's got a coil of wire, right? And it did, didn't plug in in one place. It plugged in in a couple of places. You remember what we call that? AT. Auto. auto transformer, right? It's auto transformer. We said it's uh, basically a thing that we can increase or decrease uh, by plugging in on the secondary side of this thing, right? If we plugged in right across exactly where uh, we plugged in on the primary side, if we plugged in on the primary side in exactly the same place as we plug in on the secondary side, then what happens? Essentially nothing, right? We got nothing. Um, and how did that work? Why did that happen? Because if we supply alternating current to the primary side, what do we create? A changing okay. <laughs> a charged particle in motion creates a circuit. Just so you know, I don't expect you to really know this. It's current. I don't really expect you to know this. I'm planting seeds for later in the semester. So if you don't know it, you know, just scream out possible answers. You know, I don't really care at this point. A magnetic field, it creates a magnetic field. So if we plug in on the opposite side in exactly the same place, we'll get 100 volts in or, and that creates 100 volts out. So what we're using is alternating current to create a changing magnetic field. 
so that we can create an alternating current in the secondary side of the coil, right? So if we mash them together, what do we do? It goes voltage goes down. down, right? Voltage goes down. So we decrease our voltage, we're shooting the hand, now we've got 50 kVp is what we're eventually gonna have. But we don't have kVp yet, right? This is our kVp selector, but we don't have kVp until it comes out of this, comes out of this and goes into another one where our turns ratio is set and we have more turns on the secondary. Yeah, secondary side than what we have on the primary side, right? So we supply an alternating current to this and what do we create? Same answer? Magnetic field. Changing magnetic field, right. So if we move the secondary coil close enough to it, then what do we create in the secondary side? Alternating current, right. So we've got alternating current, and this transformer here, this is our auto transformer, right, which is a type of rheostat. So um, this over here is our, we've now got KVP, so what happened to our voltage here? It decreased. Uh, not there yet. The other one. It increased, right. So we got very high voltage now. So this is our high voltage transformer. Now we've got KVP, right? At the same time, we're coming off of that going into a filament transformer or a filament circuit where we set our MA and then it comes out of that and it goes into a step. This is a step up, step up transformer. So this one would be a step down transformer and we can tell it's a step down transformer because it's got more turns on the primary side than what it has on the secondary side. So this one is responsible for decreasing voltage down to maybe 10 volts. It's really 15. But then it comes out of that and it goes into the x-ray tube. So we've got a filament and on the opposite side of the filament we've got the anode and I'll go ahead and pass these around for y'all too so you can kind of get your hands on them. Remember, these are light bulbs. Uh, they're vacuum tubes. You drop them, they're going to explode. Uh, so be careful. No pressure, right? <laughs> She's like, oh, don't, 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 don't hand me that. Don't, I don't want that. Uh, and this one's a little bit heavier uh, because this thing is full of oil. Um, and I'll explain the, the purpose for that later on. Okay, so these are x-ray tubes, and if you look inside the one uh, that doesn't have that, then what you'll see is a lot of different things. One is that the big disc here spins around and around, and on the other end you can see two filaments that look like light bulbs, okay? So, now what we've got is whenever we press the prep button on the x-ray tube, what we're going to get is activation of this entire lower circuit. Okay, so we've got flow of electrons, which is what kind of energy? Electric energy, right? So we're still just at nuclear energy to electric energy, and we're gonna send it down this wire, and we're gonna heat this up to the point that it glows. That's a, a phenomenon that we call therm, because it's hot, ionic, because they're all ions, which are electrons, Emissions, so the emission of hot ions from this thing's thermonic emissions, okay? Am I creating x-rays yet? No, I don't create x-rays until I send them across the x-ray tube. So are they positioned in a point, at a point where we might create x-rays if the conditions are right? Yes. Yes, so what does that sound like? They're positioned where they might create x-rays if we let them go. Potential, exactly. Potential energy. So we got potential energy. We've got a lot of heat there, which is thermal energy. Uh, what's the main thing that's going to kill an X-ray tube? Heat. Heat, right. So um, why do we create heat? Well, we can't get around it. We're going to create it. Uh, we don't want to, but we got to. Well, we got potential energy. Potential energy is going to be our measure of KVP. Okay, so eventually we're going to apply the high voltage circuit, we're going to plug this into it, and we're going to release our electrons. So we've released the potential, what does that become? Kinetic. Kinetic, exactly. 
kinetic energy. So they travel across the x-ray tube, and then once they get across the x-ray tube, we've got two possible interactions. We've got the nucleus of the atom where we've got the positive charges, which are the protons. protons. We've got the neutrons, and we've got the electrons. And if one of these electrons gets close enough to the nucleus of the atom that it makes a big U-turn, it loses energy, right? If it loses energy because of the law of conservation of energy, the energy's gotta go somewhere. So if it comes in with 50 kVp worth of energy and it leaves with one kVp worth of energy, it lost energy. Where does that energy go? Thermal energy. Creation of an X-ray photon. Okay, the squiggly line is always gonna be X-ray photon, okay? Straight line is always gonna be a projectile electron. The projectile meaning it's flying, okay? So projectile electron, and, and, and then we've got creation of x-ray photon, okay? So what kind of uh, x-ray creation do we call that? Brims. Brims, very good, you did watch the video. It's brims, what does that stand for? Something long. <laughs> right, something long, right? Brimstralone, what does it mean? It went. You hit the to stop, huh? Breaking. Slowing or breaking? Okay. So, <laughs> Bram's just, just yeah. sometimes you you know you don't get close. Uh, so all right. So X-ray creation number one is Bram's. X-ray creation number two is where the electron, the projectile electron, hits the uh, orbital electron and knocks it out of place. All right, so what's gonna happen? Is it a natural condition for that, that atom to be in? No, so it wants to replace that. So another orbital electron and next shell out drops into place. And what happens because of the interaction between the two? There's instability. There's instability, but in that interaction between knocking that out and drawing another one in, we're gonna kick off a X-ray photon, right. So what do we call that? Uh, characteristic. characteristic, very good. It's characteristic, and we call it characteristic because it's specific to the type of target we use. And the type of target we use is tungsten. Okay, so that big spinny disc is nothing but tungsten. Well, it's got a little bit of an alloy to it, but it's mainly tungsten. So the tungsten, um, the binding energy, the, the reason we call it characteristic is because that binding energy is, um, is always the same on tungsten atom. So we knock it out, we can count on exactly what level of, of x-ray photon we create. So only two different ways that we create x-ray photons. One is brims and the other is characteristic. And what kind of energy is that? So we got electric, we got potential, we got kinetic, we got nuclear, what is that? Electromagnetic. Electromagnetic, exactly. Now, did we have electromagnetic anywhere else? Yeah, we created light, right? That's electromagnetic too, but that's not really the type of, of uh, electromagnetic that we're truly interested in at this point. Now, y'all haven't had a lab yet. Some of you may have shadowed. What you'll see in the x-ray tube, I'm not sure that that shows. What you'll see in the x-ray tube is that you don't see the x-ray tube. X-ray tube is inside of, of what we'll call protective housing. So the x-ray tube, that thing is inside of here and it's locked away and you can't see it. So it's inside this big metal thing. This thing down here is what we call polymer housing. That's where you beam restrict um, your, your x-ray. We're interested in visible light, but not visible light here. What we have inside of this is a, uh, a set of shutters so we can limit the beam, the x-ray beam, to just what we want to see, all right? So um, call matter housing is here, but at the same time, what, what we've got is a mirror, and the mirror is on a perfect 45 degree angle. The reason the mirror is on an angle like that is because that light field that you see, that you position your x-ray beam to correspond to the light field. Let me take that. Yes, please. Okay. <laughs> um, 
That thing is um, reflecting a light from a light bulb over here. Okay, so why don't we just put the light bulb right there? It won't burn it. But what I actually see through real well? You, air, you know, bones to a lesser degree. Does it not see through well? Well, you may not know yet, but whenever you, you have your patient uh, prepare for an exam, you gotta take zippers off, you gotta take buttons off, you gotta take snaps off, away from them. Um, so what are those things made out of? Metal, Metal right, metal. Well, what's the light bulb filament made out of? Metal. Metal, it doesn't see it very well. So unless you want every x-ray you shoot to have a great big squiggly line through it, you can't have it there, okay? So the light is actually coming from a side and it's being projected down and it should perfectly correspond with the, the uh, radiation beam. So do we use other types of electromagnetic radiation? Absolutely, visible light. So that's most of them, but where might we use chemical energy? Who's shadow? Okay, did you see any portables? you drag this big thing with you with a, a power cord all the way up from, from the department? No. Did you plug the machine in right before you shot? Some of them you do, some of them you don't. The ones you don't, use batteries so the electricity doesn't come from a you know, miniature nuclear power plant inside of the, the portable unit. There's a bank of batteries in there, okay? So the batteries supply the electric energy that eventually does all this same stuff. Okay. What about nuclear energy? I well, always said here, but uh, has anybody seen or heard or know of anybody who works in nuclear medicine? Okay, nuclear medicine, we image not really for diagnosis of anatomy, but usually for diagnosis of physiology and pathology associated with, with uh, physiology. We'll actually put, <laughs> sounds awful put uh, radi radioactive material inside of a patient and look for the response from the internal organs, okay? So we don't really use that in diagnostic, but we do use it in nuclear medicine. Did I miss any of those? Or did I hit them, hit them all? So we got potential, kinetic, chemical, electric energy, thermal energy, nuclear energy, electromagnetic energy, I think I, I, think I hit them all. So any questions on all that? So we use them all um, in different places, and it's just conversion of, of one type of energy to another uh, to accomplish our ultimate goal, which is creation of, of electromagnetic energy in the upper end of the electromagnetic spectrum. All right? So, um, and then you can transfer energy to matter, matter to energy, and we kind of touched on that. It's really easy to see matter to energy. Uh, you cut out a tree, you split the logs, you burn them, and what do you get? Thermal energy. You get electromagnetic energy in the in a form of light, right? But to visualize um, energy to to mass, uh, it takes a little bit longer, right? And you eat a buffet every day, what are you gonna do? <laughs> you can, can wait, which is exactly what that is, the energy to the mass. You know, you see the tree grow. Uh, it takes a while, but it happens. Okay, so radiation, uh, we tend to think of radiation, I touched on this on Wednesday, we tend to think of radiation as being a bad thing, and it can be. Uh, Fukushima was uh, some bad radiation exposure. Uh, Chernobyl, which was again, before y'all were born, uh, was a bad thing, um, but uh, not all radiation is bad. Um, even though some radiation that's not bad necessarily can be bad, you know, uh, sound waves. Uh, you've got to have particles with sound waves. It's vibration of, of particles, um, movement of particles to, to convey sound from one place to another. Sound gets too loud and what do you get? 
hearing loss, right? Um, visible light, you know, that light's not bad, but what if we focus it down to a laser? Can it be bad? Absolutely. So um, just the word radiation by itself is not necessarily bad. Uh, some radiation is bad. Some amounts of even non-bad radiation can be bad as well, though. Um, and certainly what we deal with is, is radiation, but we're going to teach you the best ways to um, protect yourself from, uh, you know, hopefully having any kind of ill effects of, of the radiation itself. So generally, whenever we're talking about uh, exposure to specific types of radiation that can be harmful, um, there's, we have a word for that exposure. You absorb some of the radiation, we call that being irradiated. All right, so you're standing in, in the room with a patient and uh, you get hit with radiation being, you've been irradiated or exposed. Um, most of the time we'll just use the word exposed, but exposed and irradiated being exactly the same thing. You intercepted some some uh, radiation. Now the type of radiation that we're going to be talking about most over the next couple of years is uh, electromagnetic radiation, but specifically we're going to be talking about ionizing electromagnetic radiation. Now, what I've drawn here, um, you're going to have a tendency to confuse uh, interactions in the patient with interactions in the X-ray tube. This is interaction in the X-ray tube. But the same thing happens essentially inside of the patient's body. So again, what does squiggly lines represent? Radiation. It represents x-rays, right? The straight lines represent? Protection. Energy. Electric, uh, electrons. So we've got projectile electron, and then we've got x-ray creation. Now inside of the patient's body, what you're gonna have, again, You've got nucleus with protons, neutrons, and you've got orbital electrons. So if you have an X-ray photon, we can tell that's an X-ray photon because it is a squiggly line, right? So if the X-ray photon has enough energy, it's not really kinetic energy, I guess you could call it kinetic energy, but um, it, you know, it's a wave of pure energy that behaves kind of like a particle, it's kind of weird. That's why electromagnetic energy is so weird, is it's got different uh, properties to it. If it ejects that electron, then we've got what inside the patient's body? A charged particle is what? Ion. It's an ion, right? So we've created an ion. That being a charged particle, just an electron all by itself is an ion. So if this had one proton and one electron, then our net charge of this particular atom was neutral. The two charges negate each other. Okay? But once I remove that, what's the, the net charge of that? It's positive. Right. So it is also an ion. Right. So we, this is also an ion. So we've created two ions. You call both of your shoes what? A pair. pair right. So this is an ion pair. pair. Okay. So now, let's go back to our table on page 49. So we've got all these different levels of, of electromagnetic radiation, okay? So at the top, what we've got is x-rays and gamma rays, and just below that we've got ultra, ultraviolet. Now what you need to understand about this chart is that um, there's some bleed over between those. Okay, so uh, very high energy X-rays and very or lower energy gamma rays are identical. Upper level um, um, has lost it. ultraviolet and lower energy X-rays look and behave exactly alike. All right. So when we're talking about ionizing radiation. It's a radiation that has high enough energy to remove an orbital electron, thereby creating an ion. So really only three that we're gonna recognize as being ionizing radiation, that would be X-rays, gamma rays, and ultraviolet rays, okay? So incidentally, radiation burns, which were very common in the, the first you know, 10, 15 years of, of uh, after Rankin uh, discovered X-rays, uh, 
because they had a lot of radiation burns, a lot of radiation burns. The initial stage of a radiation burn from exposure to ionizing radiation looks just like sunburn, okay? Um, the decay, you know, if you've ever had a really, really bad sunburn, you know, you get those blisters and then sometimes it, it you know, you may have a sore there for a while, okay? So your uh, x-ray burns, your radiation burns from x-rays, gamma rays, um, the lasting results are gonna be much more significant than, than what just the sunburn is. But all three of them fundamentally are, are uh, some forms of ionizing radiation. It's just x-rays and gamma rays are much you know, worse than, than what ultraviolet rays are, okay? So any questions on that? Okay, then we're going to touch on the, the uh, sources of electro or of ionizing radiation, then we're going to call it a, a day. So, um, sources of ionizing radiation, you can break it down into two different sources, and really only two different sources, and that is natural and not natural. Okay, so what we have is uh, ionizing radiation comes to us and you've been exposed since the moment you were conceived. Um, terrestrial radiation will be you know, what, what you get out of the ground, essentially. So here on Earth, we've, we've got constant decay of plutonium, uranium, you know, any other eon things that are, um, that are radioactive. So you got all these things. I need a camera that shows the whole room. I need to just back it up. Because and this that, all right. So um, terrestrial radiation is radiation that's here, all right, on the ground. Um, the most common, it kind of ferrets out radon uh, all by itself as kind of a different type of terrestrial radiation. It's just terrestrial radiation. Uh, radon is a, the biggest contributor of terrestrial radiation, but it is terrestrial radiation. So it's natural radiation. It comes from building materials. Cement emits radon. Wallboard emits radon. And it's generally not a problem until you know it, it becomes a problem. It's, it's not a problem until the, the radiation exposure from the radon gets so high that um, that you know it becomes an issue. So we got uh, terrestrial. We got cosmic. The sun emits X-rays. The stars emit x-rays, so we get blasted from those, all right? So we've got natural, oh, and you've got internally deposited radio, radionucleides. You've got um, radiation inside of your body, so you're exposing yourself. As long as you're living, you've got a set amount of carbon-14 would be an example. Um, you've got a set amount of carbon-14 inside of your body, and once you die, uh, you're no longer living in that um, carbon-14 doesn't renew or replace any uh, other carbon-14 that starts to, de to decay. That's the basis for radiometric dating. Um, they can generally tell within, say, 60,000 years when something died uh, within a, a pretty narrow window. So you emit the carbon-14. Uh, um, and then you've got man-made radiation, sources of man-made radiation. Um, and the biggest contributor to man-made radiation is medical imaging. Nuclear medicine, CAT scan, x-rays, x-rays being the, the biggest contributor. But you've also got some things like consumer products. And I, I gotta tell you, if you ever get a chance to go see a Bouchon uh, speech, you know, he, he comes through once in a while. He, uh, he works at MD Anderson, or, or one of the UT facilities down in, in Houston. And uh, once in a while, he'll come through and he'll give a, a talk. And he is a character. He's a funny man. Um, and uh, he, he talks about the different consumer products and the uh, amount of radiation that you get from them. He'll tell you exactly how many con consumer products you can eat before you get too much radiation exposure. But consumer products like uh, fire detectors or smoke detectors have a small amount of radioactive material inside them. So, we get some exposure from that as well. Um, you might have noticed if, if you read ahead that he talks about where um, 
radiation doses more and where it's less in natural background radiation. And this is kind of a, again, getting a, a little deeper into the, into the semester. But um, what we have, let's say we've got the earth there and then we've got water and we've got mountaintops, right? So radiation dose, natural background radiation dose is worse at the top of the mountain than what it is, uh, let's say, if you're on a boat. I'll draw this. A boat in the ocean. Why is that? A sailboat. What do you suppose that is? Mountains closer to the sun. Okay, closer to the sun, closer to the source of cosmic rays. But also, what, what's the mountain made out of? Dirt, rock, right? What are building materials made out of? Uh, substances that, that you pull out of the ground. So you're standing up on top of the mountain, you're getting exposed much more than, than what you are in the ocean because what's under you on the ocean? Water. We standing on water? No, there's not a whole lot there. So you're further away from the source, which is the sun and the stars, you're further away from the source down here and also you're not, you know, around building as many building materials in the ocean as what you are, you know, on the top of the mountain or even sitting in the classroom. So there's your, there's your justification for buying a boat and living in the ocean is you're scared of radiation. Okay.